Good morning. I am Tony Davis, Community Affairs Officer for the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And I want to thank all of you for joining us for this World Health Day event. We have a terrific lineup of speakers that are ready to discuss some very important topics with us this morning. Please note that all remarks are on the record and that this event is being recorded. The views expressed today are those of the presenters and do not necessarily represent those of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. There will be no audience Q&A this morning, but if you have any questions related to the event or our new health initiative, please feel free to reach out to me at any time. Now, I would like to introduce Jack Goot, who is the head of communications and outreach here at the New York Fed, to provide us with some opening remarks. Over to you, Jack. Thank you, uh, Tony, and I hope uh, everybody is well and can hear me uh, just fine. I will assume I will assume as much. Um, so thank you, uh, Tony, and thank you all. Uh, my name is Jack Goot. I head up communications and outreach here at the New York Fed, and I, it is my great pleasure to welcome everyone to this very important event, looking at the global perspectives on the social determinants of health. I want to especially thank our co-sponsors, the NYU School of Global Public Health and the International Society of Urban Health, as well as our distinguished panel, and a special thanks to my New York Fed colleagues for putting this together. My comments here today reflect my own views and not necessarily those of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. So I'd like to start by just saying a few words. Today's virtual forum highlights a new focus area for the New York Fed, led by our community development team, Health. We've certainly learned through this pandemic that a healthy economy requires healthy people. And when poor health is both a cause and a consequence of poverty, economic mobility and economic growth stagnate. The COVID-19 crisis revealed the flaws of our social safety nets, as well as racial and economic disparities in baseline health, access to quality health care, and health outcomes in the US and certainly abroad. For example, Johns Hopkins University of Medicine reports that while Black Americans represent only about 13% of the population in the state's reporting racial and ethnic information of people who have died of COVID-19, they account for about 34% of total COVID deaths in those same states. Similarly, Asian and Latinx Americans experience higher rates in some regions. So what can we do as the New York Fed? We think part of our role is to connect the dots between health and wealth, bring together doctors, thought leaders, and others who are recognized both domestically and internationally, to speak on how we may better focus our work to address the social determinants of health. We hope to learn from them on what are effective solutions to disparate health outcomes, what are some opportunities to connect capital to those solutions, and how might we best address the changing landscape as we surface from this pandemic? I'm privileged and excited to introduce a close partner to the, to the Fed, Dr. Joe Ivy Buford, a clinical professor at the NYU School of Global Public Health and a secretariat from the International Society of Urban Health. Dr. Buford will moderate our panel discussion, which focuses on these issues and what actions governments, healthcare institutions, and the financial sector can take to create lasting change. Thank you, and it is now my privilege to turn the mic over to Dr. Buford. Joe, good morning. Good morning, thank you very much, Jack. I wanna welcome everyone uh, to this very timely session in uh, observation of World Health Day. Um, the topic is Global Perspectives on Social Determinants of Health. Um, and I wanna start by thanking Tony Davis for his leadership on the health initiative of the New York Federal Reserve's Community Development Strategy, and also to David Erickson, who you'll meet later, who initiated the dialogue among leaders in the community development, health, and financial sectors from his earlier role at the San Francisco Fed, and happily now in his role um, at the New York Fed. When we hear the word health in the US and often globally, we immediately think of personal health care and the more uh, the healthcare delivery system, especially hospitals. The idea that there are influences on health and the ability of individuals to be healthy 
maybe even more strongly determined by conditions in the communities in which they live is a relatively new theme uh, in global health policy and in the United States and often less well understood. The term social determinants of health was introduced into current global and national health conversations in the World Health Organization's Commission on the Social Determinants of Health, which issued its report in 2008. And it still means different things to different key groups. And we'd like to explore this um, in the next hour. The urgency of gaining a clear understanding of social determinants of health has been starkly revealed in the shared global experience of the COVID pandemic. The personal health care delivery system, the courage of health care workers and the excellence of hospitals, um, as well as the challenges for caring for enormous numbers of sick people and saving lives as the science developed often took center stage in the media and the need for strong healthcare delivery systems in communities and countries that didn't have them was made very clear. But slowly, we also began to see that more and more the results of the pandemic were most severe on people living in poor communities, people of color, especially in the United States, and individuals with pre-existing conditions, heart disease, diabetes, lung disease, many of which were preventable had the systems been in place to assure that uh, primary care and prevention were available and um, because of community conditions that uh, needed to be improved. These disparities in health and the inequities in community conditions and resources were also starkly apparent, um, especially in cities during COVID, often for the first time to the broader public and political leaders. And so we hear the calls to build back better, build back fairer, a clear understanding of the challenges involved in that goal uh, to achieve health have never been more important. We're fortunate today to have a panel uniquely suited to clarifying the work to be done. Professor Sir Michael Marmot um, is director of the International Institute for Society and Health and uh, MRC Research Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health at University College London. He's led a research group on health inequalities for the past 30 years, and he chaired the WHO Global Commission on Social Determinants of Health. Donald Schwartz is Senior Vice President uh, for Program of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. He guides the foundation's strategies and works closely with colleagues, external partners, and community leaders to build a culture of health in America enabling everyone to live their healthiest possible life. He also has been a leader, a national leader in public health and a health commissioner for the city of Philadelphia. Dr. Mickey Chopra is currently the global solutions lead for service delivery in the health, nutrition and population global practice of the World Bank. He leads its work around the organization, management and quality of health services. And previous to this, he was the chief of health and associate director of programs at UNICEF's New York headquarters. And Helene Gale has been president and CEO of the Chicago Community Trust, one of the nation's oldest and largest community foundations since 2017. For almost a decade, she was president and CEO of CARE, a leading international humanitarian organization, and an expert on global development, humanitarian, and health issues. Dr. Gale also spent 20 years with the Centers for Disease Control, working primarily on HIV AIDS. We'll run this session as a conversation among our panelists uh, in response to a set of questions um, for about 40 minutes and then hear closing remarks uh, from our hosts, uh, Tony David and David Erickson. So let me start uh, with the first question, important one on definitions. Um, if we're going to do something about the problems, we have to share these clear definitions. And we've heard these terms a lot in the media and politics and healthcare. Uh, social determinants of health. So starting with Sir Michael Marmot, who most recently put these terms into the global conversation, um, I'd like him to start by telling us, um, you know, sort of about the definition, its emergence uh, from the Global Commission and um, the essentially the challenges of beginning to get a shared understanding of the term. Then we'll move on to our other panelists uh, for, com for comments, for their comments. Michael? Thank you, and it's a pleasure to join you today. In our Global Commission report, published in 2008, 
closing the gap in a generation. We defined the, <coughs> the social determinants of health as the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age, and inequities in power, money, and resources that drive these inequities in the conditions of daily life. It's rather important. When most organizations talk about health, they mean healthcare. When the OECD talks about national spending on health, they don't mean that. They mean national spending on health care. I think of spending on health as spending on early child development, education, better employment and working conditions, improving neighborhoods, pensions for older people, reducing social isolation. That's spending on health, not just spending on health care. Um, people have tried to estimate how much of the inequities in health we see are due to health care and to their social determinants. Difficult to estimate, but most people would say it's probably around 85% social determinants and 15% health care. And yet all the attention tends to be on the 15% rather than the 85%. And COVID-19, just to jump ahead, exposed the underlying inequalities in society and amplified them. And the societal response to the pandemic just increased the inequities in the social determinants of health. Thanks very much for getting us started. Really, really important to know that there is a definition uh, codified because this is a really key reference point for our discussion. Uh, let me ask Dr. Shoper, Mickey, if you would uh, comment. You've had a broad experience in various UN agencies. How is this conversation proceeding uh, as you see it globally and especially in the UN system? Yeah, at this point, I'd like to bring out two aspects. One, which I'm heavily involved in at the moment, is how the global health system, and the, but wider than that, is actually increasing inequities across the world. And, and of course, we're seeing this with the vaccines and how the global rules around um, patents and IP, intellectual property rights, as well as manufacturing capacity, it means that uh, I've just come back from South Africa. There's uh, a third wave that's going to hit them very soon, and they're pretty well helpless because they have very limited access to vaccines, even though they're producing the J&J &J vaccine right now. They have factories there, but they're all exporting these vaccines to, to, to the north. Um, so one practical immediate thing that we're seeing, the social determinant of health is very much around these global ways in which we've structured um, some of the IP. The other um, aspect which we're you know, coming to the fore again is, as you know, COVID is the coronavirus. It's not the first um, to have hit um, and, and jumped over the, uh, the barrier, if you like. Um, SARS, uh, but also Ebola, we've seen other viruses do the same. And this really draws attention to the threats to health are quite, you know, are outside the health system. So in this case, the agricultural and food system, um, um, both in terms of uh, making um, impoverished people, um, you know, uh, on the margins in, in developing countries, um, makes this far more likely. But also in, in middle and higher income countries, we're seeing it with non-communicable diseases. The drivers of these um, illnesses are not within the health system uh, or within the health care as we normally define it is outside it's the food that's available it's the promotion of those foods it's the transport systems and I, so i do i mean speaking from the world bank perspective it's something which um we're we're recognizing we have to pay far more attention to and also asking questions about how is it that we've got to a point where these key systems are actually um creating more um bad outcomes uh, and returns on investments um, uh, how have we got to this status quo that we have right now thank you very much uh, really important observations i want to sort of bring this conversation um into the united states uh, the robert johnson foundation was one of the first to take the who 
Global Commission report and really begin to develop this conversation further in the United States. Um, I want to ask Don to really, uh, again, address this issue of, uh, in a sense, introducing social determinants into the U.S., which I think is particularly challenging um, given the dominance of our healthcare system, and then how that um, has developed through the work of the foundation. Don? Thanks, Joe. Uh, I have to say that we have been working for the last decade on bringing the definition that Michael described to the nation more broadly. And uh, in doing so, we have highlighted not only the drivers of health, social, economic, and environmental drivers, but also the underlying bias and discrimination factors that structurally affect who can be healthy in our country. Um, what our journey has been, has been one of not only trying to convince people that we need to focus more on those underlying drivers, but also to try to bring to the healthcare system, the public health system, the social service system, a new orientation to appreciate how those social, economic, and environmental factors, and particularly discrimination and bias, affect health so that the system itself can be party to addressing the improvement of health in this country. I want to say that in COVID, while COVID has shined a light very clearly on social determinants and their impact on health, for the press in this country and for much of though many of those in the healthcare system, the irony has been that the light has been shined on the healthcare system once again because of the critical need for so many people and the shortage of healthcare beds and facilities. And unfortunately, that narrative has been uh, a necessary one and has been one that has, I think, overwhelmed the media coverage of social determinants in many cases. So we see the, the bias and the view and the lens that we've used over time to think about health as health care, once again, coming to the surface. And conversations like this and the conversations in the media that have happened to talk about bias, discrimination, and the patterns of who has been most affected by COVID um, have been really important in trying to promote in this time uh, a larger focus on those social determinants. Thanks very much, Don. And Helene, uh, could you share with us sort of your journey around this issue of social determinants? You know, obviously, you're on the front lines in Chicago really trying to see how this translates into action. Um, maybe you could you can talk to us about that. Yeah, uh, yeah, thanks, I was muted. Um, yeah, and in some ways, you know, when I look at what I've done professionally, it, it, it mirrors um, my own journey, kind of mirrors my thinking around the social determinants of health. I went from an individual practitioner as a pediatrician to public health, then to looking at uh, global poverty, and now here in, in Chicago, uh, focused on closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap. And you know, all along that journey, um, I continued to realize that if we really wanted to have an impact on health disparities, it wasn't by focusing primarily on what the tools that we had in our um, medical or even our public health toolkit. It's really looking at some of these broader social determinants of health, and it's, you know, it's why um, we have made our highest priority as a, as the foundation closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap because it is so much of the root cause of some of these issues that we're talking about. And you know, Chicago has one of the largest life expectancy gap of any city in America. You can. Um, go to our gleaming downtown and people have a life expectancy of 90 years, go five, six miles uh, south or, or west, 
and that plummets to 65 to 60 year life expectancy. So, you know, up to a 30 year life expectancy gap just because of the zip code that you live in. And, you know, I think here people are starting to really uh, put into motion the social determinants of health. Uh, people are starting to recognize that it is not about better outreach um, from hospital and health systems, getting more people in, uh, which, into health services. Clearly, we know that, that that is necessary, but not sufficient. And more and more people are really looking at if we want to have an impact on people's health, how do we connect the dots between jobs that people have, uh, whether they have access to quality education, whether they have access to nutritious food, whether the streets, uh, whether there's public safety, whether people can take a walk and exercise in their neighborhoods, all these things that we know are uh, at the root cause of a lot of the disparities we see. And it is, uh, you know, as Don mentioned, um, while we focused a lot on the health service side of COVID, you know, we know that this disproportionate impact is in communities of color particularly is because of the jobs people work. It's, it's the homes people live in. Uh, it's whether or not people have the ability to work from home and keep themselves safe, socially distanced in crowded households, et cetera. So I think more and more people are starting to realize that if we want to have an impact on health, we've got to think outside of the health box. But, you know, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, and if we look at what is spent on health care relative to what is spent on some of these other issues, you know, it's clear that we've got to think about funding as core to this and really connecting funding to some of the things that we know can have the greatest impact on health and health disparities. Thanks, Elaine. I think you, you've really given an important uh, look at uh, at the issue of, of inequities and disparities in your in your own work. And I want to I want to really kind of drill down on that if we have clarity about the sort of range of, of, of inequities that there are and the sort of range of actions that are necessary. I wanted to ask each of you to just uh, to talk a little bit about, um, Helene started the conversation, I'm gonna come back to her sort of towards the end again, but um, about how this clarity or the emerging clarity about equity and disparities, how do you see that in your work? How um, is it, how are you trying to address it, make it more prominent, take action, get your organizations or in the work that you're doing, sort of think of this equity issue as, a, as an agenda for action in the context of the broader social determinants, not just access to healthcare, which is uh, maybe a more co prominent conversation. I'm like, Mickey, you're, you're nodding your head. Let me start with you first and then <laughs> we'll move on. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And, and just to give you one more, you know, one example again of um, how this, this outbreak has really focused at the bank, at least on some of the factors that we were perhaps not paying enough attention to, um, this issue of negative externalities. Um, so just to give you one example, like I said, I've been working in South Africa recently. And during the lockdowns, one of the things they did was to stop or reduce the um, sale and distribution of alcohol. Um, and it had a profound impact on the numbers of homicides in, uh, and of domestic abuse and of uh, trauma cases, uh, particularly in the poorest uh, parts of the country and in, in, in the poor uh, urban settings in, in particular. And so it really drew attention to the role of something like alcohol, the tax policies of, you know, um, uh, as you know, SA Breweries is one of the largest, if not the largest uh, alcohol uh, company in the world. Um, so there's a very practical example of how um, the, you know, things which we knew were important for health, um, but have really been brought out because of this um, pandemic. And the challenge um, working in the bank is to how do we get our economists and our finance people, as well as our trade uh, our people to really um, look beyond the immediate uh, return on investments and really take into account these externalities, uh, particularly these negative externalities, uh, which have quite profound impacts, not just on health, but as we're now seeing on the economy itself. So the, the South African economy, many economies have been devastated because of this outbreak. 
Um, and so I think we need to start, how do we get the tools to put those costs into our, our investment cases or in, in our conversations with our agriculture, our trade uh, and, 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 and manufacturing um, like, um, parts of the bank um, as they have their conversations around investment priorities as well. Yeah, that's, that would be amazing in terms of the leverage and potential impact uh, were that to happen. But but as you say, difficult. Um, Michael, I wanted to come to you next. You mentioned you mentioned in the re, in the commission report really talks about differentials in power and resources. And I know um, you have also uh, really increased your focus on equity um, in in your work with heads of state and and other regional reports you've done. Maybe you could tell us a bit about that and how you see the most promising strategies, perhaps, uh, to tackle those, those issues. Well, if I could briefly tell you a tale of two countries. Uh, the bad news is that I'm not Dickens. Uh, the good news is that I'm not Dickens because it would take us till tomorrow. Um, but the two countries being the UK and the US. Uh, in the wake of the Global Commission, I produced the so-called Marmot Review in England, 2010, of what we could do to apply the recommendations of the Global Commission on Social Determinants of Health to one country, England. And we had six domains of recommendations, early child development, education, employment and working conditions. Number four, having enough money to live on. Number five, healthy and sustainable communities. And six, taking a social determinants approach to prevention. Well, in February last year, I produced the Marmot Review 10 years on. And the UK had the slowest improvement in life expectancy uh, in the decade from 2010 of any rich country except the United States. Wow. And that was before the pandemic. And then we handled the pandemic in the UK. If you look at excess mortality, we were even worse than the United States. The US was a disaster and the UK was worse. And I asked myself, what's the link? How come both our countries were doing so poorly before the pandemic and then handled the pandemic disastrously? What's the link between these two? And I think the link works at four levels. Firstly, the quality of governance and political culture. Do I need to spell that out for you in the US before the pandemic? I doubt it. Um, second, the increase in social and economic inequalities, because we not only did we see a slowdown in improvement in life expectancy, but we saw an increase in inequalities in life expectancy. And in both countries, life expectancy for the poorest people got worse, went down. In the US, you talk about deaths of despair. Happily, we didn't have those in the UK, but life expectancy for the poorest people still went down. So the first was quality of governance. The second was increased social and economic inequalities. The third was disinvestment from the public sector. The quality of services, not just health care. <clears throat> we in the England and the UK had regressive cuts to social services. It would be hard for the US to have regressive cuts. You've got such a thin safety net already. There's not much to cut. Um, but we cut ours to smithereens in a regressive way. And the fourth was that we weren't very healthy coming into the pandemic. So coming out of the pandemic, and the reason I called my report Build Back Fairer, is that we need to address these four, the quality of governance, the growing social and economic inequalities, the disinvestment from the public sector, and the quality of the social safety net, and the fact that we weren't very healthy. And it's fundamental. And so in my Build Back Fair report, we laid out a set of specific recommendations related to the six I mentioned in my 2010 review. But the overarching recommendation was to put equity of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy. Thanks very much. I'm going to 
Don, you don't, I don't think it's going to be equal time because I, don't, I think the reality we're all pretty familiar with, but um, really talking about uh, the foundation, you have been a leader in the issue of, of health equity and social justice um, during this conversation. How does that conversation go? What have you tried? What are you trying to do within the U.S.? Where do you see opportunities? Um, then I'm going to go into Helene to focus on Chicago, and I'm glad Michael introduced the notion of politics. I think it's uh, political leadership is not unimportant, so I want to keep that in the conversation if we can. Thanks, Joe. Um, I think the the best example, perhaps, of responding quickly was around identifying disproportionality. So ironically, in this country, where we are arguably data rich, we didn't have disaggregated data, as I think everybody recognizes, early on in the pandemic to identify the disproportionality and who was being most affected. So that early signals that communities of color, for instance, were disproportionately affected by COVID came from little reports, not from a data system or anything that was robust in this country to look at and report on the incidence of disease. So we, in the spring of last year, began funding work to improve those data systems in real time to get information reported on who was being affected by COVID. That kind of in the moment response is something that we've tried increasingly to do as issues of equity have come forward. Underlying all of it though is the lack of voice and the lack of agency for communities that have been disproportionately affected by discrimination and bias. We have in the last six months made very large investments in base building and community power development across communities in this country in direct response to what we've seen as not only as Michael mentions the despair within communities, but rather the the disproportionality and harm that's caused to communities because of a lack of voice and a lack of agency. And we're hopeful that over the longer run, those grants will help to build the kind of power that will be needed to both expose the structural factors that are driving inequity, but also to help address them. It's really helpful. I, I think um, all of our, our previous speakers really talking about um, framing this conversation from the global and the national level. Helene, you're on the front lines in a one of the world's great cities, but a very complex city. And so um, I think we often think about, we need, we want this program, we want this policy, but when the rubber hits the road, um, those that are down in the community and the front lines, as, as others have said, as Don said, Mickey and other, the sort of engagement um, here. Could you talk about the equity question? It's fundamental to the initiative you are leading, but sort of how that works in Chicago, some of the, the challenges you've had in sort of taking it forward. You're muted, You're Helene. Muted. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned in my earlier comments, you know, we uh, made as a organizational priority closing the racial and ethnic wealth gap here because we felt it was so fundamentally linked to so many of the other social challenges that are faced here. And when we launched that uh, strategy um, just about uh, 18 months ago, you know, people resonated with it. It's very clear Chicago, like many of our urban um, cities, is very racially segregated. And if you look at the wealth inequality, it, it uh, largely runs along those racial lines. And we know that we have a history here in America um, that has uh, policy has created a lot of that. And some of the policy going back to things uh, like redlining and other things that basically did not allow for people of color to uh, move into the middle class because of lack of ability to uh, buy homes and buy homes in neighborhoods where values appreciated, et cetera. So, you know, when we launched it, it this um, initiative, you know, people understood that it was important, but I think the combination of COVID, which has really exposed um, our societal fault lines uh, much clearer and really highlighted that, 
along with um, the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd and, and some of the other uh, murders that really, uh, I think, for in many ways highlighted some of these issues of inequity in ways that had not been before. And so for us, um, you know, the combination of COVID, George Floyd, et cetera, I think put urgency into what was already seen as something that was really important. And as we have continued to move forward on, on our work, we have really been able to galvanize support, including the political support to really address some of these issues and really take on some of these tough um, issues that have been around for decades and decades with our you know, strong belief that unless we make some of those changes, some of the things that um, other panelists have mentioned uh, are only going in the wrong direction. We are not getting more equal as a society. We are getting more unequal as a society. And with this will mean that we will have greater and greater health disparity as well. So uh, we, we're committed to it. We feel that uh, this is an area where more and more people are recognizing we've got to once and for all really find some solutions to this growing inequity, not just for our health, uh, but for our overall um, progress, survival, and ability to keep moving forward as a nation. And let me, the, uh, you, you raised a really important issue. I want to sort of segue into the next uh, topic is really, uh, you all have talked about um, things that need to happen. And to some degree, Helene is a critical foundation nonprofit leader in, in the city of Chicago, um, have been able to sort of advance your agenda. But what would be the, I mean, if we're thinking that we're in a national conversation, a global conversation, uh, what would be the most helpful to you um, at this stage of your effort, your initiative um, in the city of Chicago? I'm going to ask each of you to think about that a bit. All of you have said, I need, to, we, it would be great to do this. It would be great to do that. I mean, let's think about how we might mobilize these, um, these global and national resources to be helpful um, to you. And it, it's good to start on the ground because that's where the action is. <laughs> well, I would just say, I would just say, I mean, I think partly while, you know, we're a grant making foundation and we can support programs on the ground and we're doing a lot of support for things like developing small business infrastructure, uh, investing and, and, and really incentivizing private investment in disinvested communities. Uh, you know, and so there's a lot of work that we're doing that our money can support. But I think we also believe strongly that it's really gonna take policy change. And so when you talk about, you know, what do we need from the national and, and global level, it really is looking at the policies that uh, are part of creating this inequity and looking at, you know, issues, um, uh, uh, Michael Marmot mentioned, you know, our almost non-existent safety net here in this country. You know, we have learned a lot through COVID and some of the COVID relief work that in fact, we can do things like give people cash and they'll use it in the right way. And that we can do things like uh, looking at unemployment um, for a range of, of different roles, including um, part-time roles and gig workers, et cetera. Uh, you know, and we're looking at things like expanding earned income tax credit that, that has been one of the most important poverty uh, reducing policies in the country. So I think there's a lot more that we can think about on the policy agenda. There's a lot that we've done during COVID that we could look at. Uh, what are some of the things that we learned that we could uh, extend? But it really is going to take real policy change if we're going to have an impact on some of these issues and ha uh, ultimately have a healthier population. Don, um, I know Robert Wood Johnson has been working in a multi-sectoral way. I'm going to pick up on Helene's notion about the policy change issues uh, because she's in Chicago in a great U.S. city. I ask you to talk a little bit about um, your role in trying to, you know, influence policy, change policy. I mean, I, I know within tax requirements, you can't be lobbyists, but you certainly can provide evidence and educate. What, what would be the most helpful to you? What, where do you see the, the openings here in the U.S.? Thanks, Joe. The, uh, I think the focus that Michael mentioned about children, I want to elevate for a minute and talk about children and families. 
So in this country, we have recently enacted or in the process of enacting a piece of legislation that reduces child poverty by 50% over the course of the next two years. That kind of immediate policy response using resources in ways that redistribute those resources to focus on children and families, particularly children and families who have been, uh, m have experienced the greatest disinvestment, that kind of policy change with direction toward particularly the next generation and the generation after, that kind of investment is critically important. And it's something that helps all of the work that we do um, by taking the massive resources that we have in this country and directing them toward investment in those who desperately need that investment, not only in the short run, but in the long run. Thanks. I want to go to um, Mickey. I'm going to tee this up to you because in my view, the World Bank is one of the most influential entities that could advance this agenda globally. I want to ask uh, Sir Michael, though, in, in advance of your, your having uh, maybe the last conversation, less uh, reaction to this discussion. Uh, you've talked to heads of state around the world. You've done these commission reports. Um, what what do you need to be even more effective than you have been um, in your experience? Or what have you seen be most effective in, in some of the countries that have really picked up this set of activities and for whom it's been a bit of a shift? I think some countries had a lot of the built-ins already, but for others, it's been more of a challenge. What would, what would help um, sort of advance this agenda as you've seen it in your in your global work michael well a, a lot of the take up and this would be of interest to you joe in your with your urban health hat on a lot of the take up has been at city level and there's been real enthusiasm uh, in different countries at city level including my own um, but it's harder uh, as don said if national policy is it, increasing child poverty it's harder to do things at city level if national policy is halving child poverty level it makes the city action much more amenable to success um, so the national policy can't be ignored it's vital i mean i look across the atlantic and say I wish we had a government that at a stroke half child poverty. I didn't look across the Atlantic before that and say, I wish we had a government just like that, that hollowed out the federal government. I didn't think there was much to uh, be envious of there. But a government that halves child poverty at a stroke makes the operation at city level much easier. So the real take, and th there's a question, why has there been this take up at city level? And I think it's because local politicians really understand the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work and age. That is what they live. They understand it. People in London or Washington or the national capital don't get it. They're a long way removed from it. The people they talk to are lobbyists and other politicians, but local politicians, they do all of that but they do understand much better where people are born, grow, live, work and age. So the action at city level is vital. Ideally, it's helped by the action at national level. Yeah, really important. I'm, I'm always happy to have a plug for cities. And I think just like COVID has brought a focus on some of these social determinants and equity, uh, the urban conversation, I think, has risen in visibility, certainly because of because of COVID. So it's a really important one. Um, Mickey, I didn't want to put you on the spot too much, but um, I mean, the bank has, you know, you have a group. I have to everybody watches the bank that's looking at global policy and on the urban side. I mean, there is an urban group. There is uh, there are regional there's regional expertise. And then there's this sort of overriding uh, history, I think, of as you pointed out, the bank more as macroeconomists rather than looking at um, at some of the challenging issues, health economics, behavioral economics, other things that, that they could implement. And I think an example of that that I recall was one of the early moments when the bank got involved in health, which was crucial in some ways, but it was also 
um, you know, health workers send remittances back that provide more input into a national economy um, than if they're staying in the country and taking care of people. Um, otherwise, it's just a cost center. And I think that's an example of this sort of stark, as you said, the if unintended consequences, the negative externalities of an analytic approach. But um, to, uh, what would be helpful to you, I guess? I mean, you, you're, you've done, you've made the diagnosis within the bank, but um, obviously the bank invites countries to send in plans, it deals with heads of state, et cetera. What, what do you need to help kind of elevate, um, you know, advance the, the agenda that you may have? I won't label it so that nothing happens to you in the meantime, but <laughs> just tell us a little bit about what, you're, what would be helpful. Yeah, just I'll hone in on maybe two or three things. The first, particularly with the audience that we have today, is the role of the federal banks uh, to and economists to make inequities and these social determinants not just something that the health communities or frontline uh, community organizers are worried about, concerned about, but actually see it as a, as a very high level macroeconomic threat just as uh, debt levels are, or just as other macro issues are. Um, I think what COVID has really brought home, and I hope this audience, you know, the case we need to make to ministries of finance around the world is inequities in health and social determinants of health is not just something that the progressives should worry about, but it's something you as, uh, as a finance minister or, or as a banker in the country should be worried about as a real threat to, to the future of your economy or the economic security. So I think making the case that this topic is not just something we do once a year to feel better, but is a core part of our economic analysis and driving our investment thinking is one, one important um, step, I think, and, and, and role that, uh, that many in the audience can play as well. I think the second is themes that have come up from, from Helene and Don and Michael and Sir Mama is, is indeed the, how can we support the government, the micro governance, if you like, the, the meaningful democratic involvement, engagement of communities, um, not just in a tokenistic sort of manner, but really setting priorities, really influencing decisions around investments uh, and, and those macro things. And so the, what role, we, we're asking so what role the bank can play to encourage those kinds of um, meaningful engagements. And I do think the bank has recognized that, that it does require a strong public sector to do that. Um, of course, the private sector has a uh, continues to have an important role to play, but in many of the settings that we work in, it's the weak public side, which is crippling um, uh, progress. So I do think echoing and reinforcing those messages that we've we've heard already around community and public um, being strong and, and trust. Important, and I'm glad you raised the issue of the private sector because I think um, it's, it's kind of new in some ways with the Sustainable Development Goal 17, inviting partners in to help with the resources required to achieve global health goals. But there's still a lot of, I see a lot of reluctance, I think, especially in elements of the public health community and others. Um, and some of it's just inexperience in dealing with private sector. Um, so it's it's good to have that at the conversation. I think we have time. I want to, it's not exactly a lightning round, but Mickey's opened it up. So I'm going to ask uh, everybody to talk. And he, he gets a m moment or two to say a little bit more, but we, we wanted to sort of uh, wrap up this panel by putting our hosts on the spot a bit and um, suggesting, and I think Mickey started it, suggesting what the Federal Reserve could do. Obviously, this is the Federal Reserve of New York that's hosting this, but it's a national group. Helene is a, on the board of the Chicago Fed. Um, and I believe the New York Fed has a potential global role with central banks. So I want to just ask Mickey maybe to kick off this last segment. Just uh, what would you like to see the Federal Reserve do um, to sort of advance the progress on social determinants and equity? Um, yeah, I think um, really um, put legitimize some of the themes that have come through and in particular like I said to you know one of the big drivers of social determinants have been these issues around the global trade uh, intellectual property global financial flows to big um, corporations you know this mega farming that's going on so these key systems food systems transport systems are being driven 
by um, finance, multinational financing flows. And so I think if the Reserve Bank could really um, ask those critical questions of these externalities, not just for local communities, but also globally, uh, and, and, and help us to, to put those as legitimate concerns, not just those of um, the health community, as these uh, um, decisions around uh, investments and financing are made. So really, I think, give, you know, put the weight of the analytical and the academic work that's been done to showcase um, how these decisions are causing more and more outbreaks of the kinds we're seeing and making as a core part of the way that which banks decide on lending and, and, and financing. Thank you. Michael, let's stay at the global level and get your comments on your, your suggestions. <laughs> well, um, the, we're actually in discussion now with the financial institution about how it can make its core activity, not corporate social responsibility, not the public relations side, but its core activity, its investment portfolio, sensitive to the social determinants of health. Because as you say, Joe, as you imply, we've had very little to do with the private sector. Um, they've had other concerns, other interests. Uh, it's, this hasn't come up. So we've been dealing with the public sector, with voluntary and community organizations, with academia, but not the private sector. That's leaving out this really vital part of the global economy and the national economy in all countries. So the discussions we're having with a leading financial institution is how its investments could be oriented to be sensitive to the social determinants of health and health equity. Now, we'll see how that comes out, but that's the kind of change I would like to see, uh, because otherwise the rest of us will sit back and say, the world's galloping off in a direction that's adverse to health equity, and we're trying to catch up and pick up the pieces. We want them to be a partner, not a creator of the problem. Fantastic. Don? Message to the to the Fed from a national foundation for the U.S. Well, I think I echo my international colleagues in saying that understanding that there's a relationship between physical health and financial health, and financial health and physical health, is pretty critical for the mindset of the Fed and using that mindset as part of the in the voice of the Fed to convince others. The Fed has more than 900 uh, doctorally prepared economists who do research. Uh, there isn't one working on health and the relationship between health and the economy in this country, which given the role of the health care sector and the role of all of the other areas that the Fed looks at and the impact on health, it feels like the banks need to think about their role uh, in understanding and talking about the relationship between health and our economy. And to be specific and give a specific example, one of the roles of the Federal Reserve is around the Community Reinvestment Act, which affects directly many of our social determinants, most notably housing and the equitable distribution and availability of housing and housing finance, particularly for those people who have been deprived of wealth in this country. So the Fed has a number of roles as a voice, as a research institution, and as a regulator, uh, all of which could make a difference to how we think about health, the effect of health on the economy, but also all of those other social determinants that affect health. Thanks. And Helene, I'm going to, you're, we're, we almost are at a lightning round now in terms of the end, but I'd love to, you're, you're sort of have a foot in, I won't say a foot in both camps, but you're seeing it from multiple perspectives you know, as a board member of the Chicago Fed, but also um, in the community seeing the results. And I just like maybe have the last word on this message to the Fed and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, well, I, I would just echo some of the things that uh, my other panelists um, members have said, you know, um, if, the if the Fed speaks, people listen and we know that. And so, you know, there's a, a bully pulpit that I think the Fed can use to talk about some of these issues. You know, when Jerome Powell um, 
started talking about issues of inequity, it really mattered to people. Hearing it come from the Fed chair, um, hearing it come from people who are le leaders of, of the local Fed. So, you know, I think the bully pulpit and just being able to continue to um, shape people's ideas around this. Secondly, as everybody said, you know, it's a huge research institution and being able to do research that is relevant to these issues and highlight some of these issues is critical and being able to give people the data that they need to take some of the actions. And then I think, you know, as, as Don mentioned, critical role for things like the CRA, um, you know, weighing in on how can that be made to be as useful and as effective as possible. So I think there's a large role. And I, you know, and I would also just say in this moment, you know, when we're looking at the Fed's data on um, COVID recovery, being able to look at that in a disaggregated way, because when we talk about unemployment um, figures, those are aggregate uh, or average figures. They're not looking at you know, that from a disaggregated way that makes helps us to understand what's happening in different communities. So I think how data are um, uh, classified, characterized, and broken down so we actually understand how um, some of these economic trends are impacting people at micro level and different parts of our population. Thanks very much. Uh, we're going to wrap up and go to our our uh, our last speaker. David's going to close us out here, Tony and David. But I want to thank the panel. I think this has been an unbelievably useful and important conversation. I know I'm going to use it in my classrooms because I think this challenge of defining and acting on social determinants and health inequities is a huge issue. So thanks so much to all of you for your participation. And I think thanks to the Federal Reserve and the Health group for inviting this conversation um, and being really seeing this as a as a first step in some ways an early step in in even further refining the agenda for action that you have so thanks very much and over to you david i think well thank you joe ivy buford thanks to the new york staff and thanks to these amazing panelists my goodness uh what a tour de force uh that was really really impressive um and you know jack goot uh, got us started on this conversation saying that you know the New York Fed could play a role in connecting the dots between health and wealth. And we, we just had an hour conversation about that that was really powerful. It reminds me of this, you know, I think about this, this topic often. Um, there's an old phrase, don't cry over spilt milk. And, um, you know, that how you respond to that, that circumstance is really depending on what your context is. Uh, the Fed does a survey on, on household financial uh, well-being, and we know that almost half the population if they were confronted with a $400 expense, can't pay it. And so when that milk falls to the floor and your children are crying for dinner, that response for the person for almost half the country is pure panic. This really results in some, some responses in your body, like a, a, what Jack Shonkoff, the pediatrician at Harvard calls toxic stress. And so, um, you know, what we need to do, and that literally gets under your skin. I mean, we know that, for example, the telomere length in your, your DNA gets shorter with experiences like that when your body is bathed in this sort of that, that kind of a the, 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 the stress of that type of situation. And that advances the aging process and makes you less healthy. So how do we confront this problem? Well, Michael Marmot reminds us that we really have to focus on the conditions of how people are born, grow, live, and age. And a lot of that really keys off of your, the control of destiny. This is something that Michael Marmot is world, world famous for in his Whitehall study, that it's really being able to control your destiny is an important predictor of future health. And, and Mickey Chopra reminds us too that systems outside of the health system, food, transportation, other systems we may not think about are drivers of health, and that can seem overwhelming. But, this, but, but the speakers remind us systems are not destiny. Systems are created and many actions and policies can add up to systems change. And we heard many ideas today, early childhood enrichment, public safety, access to fresh food, jobs paying a living wage. Um, Helene made a point about financing. Joe mentioned inviting partners from the private sector. What many of you in the audience may not know is that the US banks uh, make uh, almost $300 billion in, in investments into low-income communities uh, motivated by the Community Investment Act. And the questions going forward are how can we braid those um, funding streams with other private and public funding streams to improve the upstream social determinants of health? How can we create control of destiny for everyone? Um, on Don, Don's point about data, I wanna mention really quickly a partnership we have with NYU's medical school, Robert Wood Johnson grantee, on a city dashboard that can connect their data on medical care and social determinants of health with ours, data on access to credit down to the census tract level. 
basically neighborhoods. And our hope is that this uh, evolving dashboard will include some issues, uh, some data on climate risks as well. So I hope that will help guide future conversations and investments in areas of most need. Um, in this last 30 seconds, I just want to say, Don also mentioned lack of agency and uh, voice. I, you know, I really miss being in our headquarters on Wall Street. It's a really beautiful building. I mean, even intimidating on some level. But what I always like to remind audiences is that you own this building. It's paid by your tax dollars, sort of. It's kind of more complicated how the Fed finances itself. But the mission statement of the New York Fed is that we are working to create an economy for all segments of society. So please think about how you can use that space how you can use the New York Fed as a partner and join us for subsequent conversations that will focus on how to operationalize those events and those investments that can create uh, a sense of control, a sense of control of destiny for all. So thank you for joining us today. Thanks again to the New York Fed staff for making an amazing uh, conversation come together and um, happy World Health Day. <laughs>